Have you ever had a headache where it feels like a knife is stabbing you just right here? Yesterday I presented the case of a 65 year old woman who came to my office complaining of headaches and pain right in the back of her head. She said that it felt like a knife was stabbing her. It's been getting that it's been getting progressively worse over the past several years, but now it's gotten to the point where anytime she even sits up, she feels this pain. It's better when she lays down, but anytime she sits up and her head is putting weight on her neck, it's excruciating. And if she leans her head back, it's even worse. She can feel crunching in her neck, and if she turns to the left, it's okay. But if she turns to the right, that pain intensifies. She has what's called occipital neuralgia. So let's talk about it. I showed the CT scan of her cervical spine that shows she has significant arthritis at her C1 and C2 junction, called the atlantoaxial joint. Our C1 and C2 bone are the first two cervical vertebrae that attach our skull to our spine, and it provides a lot of the lateral motion of the spine, or when you turn your head side to side. Our C1 bone is called the atlas and it's shaped like a circle. And our C2 bone has a dens on top that's called the axis and it's shaped like a small peg. And the C1 on the C2 can rotate our head side to side. It has three synovial joints on it. And like any bone in our body, you can get arthritis in it. Here's what a normal C1, C2 facet joint should look like with a well-preserved space. And in our patient, you can see that this space is significantly collapsed. I even showed the 3D reconstructions that show that the atlas right here is angled like this and it's crunching that right side. Our C2 nerve exits right beside our C1-2 facet joint and any bone spurs or compression of that nerve will cause pain in the C2 distribution. And that's right here. We have one on the right and one on the left. And in our patient's case, her right C2 nerve is causing her pain. This picture helps explain where the C2 nerve innervates our skin, and you can see that it's right there. There are many branches of that nerve once it exits the spine and goes to different portions of the back part of our scalp. I want to be clear is that not all cases of occipital neuralgia come from compression at C1 and C2 because you can actually get compression and pain from anywhere along the course of that nerve. And in a lot of cases, there's no known compression of the nerve. The nerve can get inflamed for a variety of different reasons and cause occipital neuralgia. It can even be from demyelinating conditions or infection like herpes zoster. Any patient that presents with a headache that originates at the skull base should be evaluated for the possibility of having occipital neuralgia. It can be paroxysmal or intermittent, but it's usually described as a stabbing pain that lasts from seconds to minutes. And in some cases, like our patient, it can be continuous. It can also be unilateral or on one side, and it can be bilateral or on both sides, but bilateral cases are only about a third of the time. A good physical examination is crucial because you wanna evaluate for what's called the Tunnel sign. That means when you tap over the distribution of the nerve, the patient will have sensitivity in that region. The diagnosis is usually confirmed by an anesthetic block of the nerve, or basically where you inject numbing medicine over the nerve to give temporary relief. Up to 40% of the time though, that may be negative, so a second injection is prudent to rule out the diagnosis. If the injection is positive, meaning it gives temporary relief of the symptoms, you can be more confident that the diagnosis is occipital neuralgia. Once the diagnosis of occipital neuralgia is made, imaging is prudent to rule out something that may be compressing the nerve. Not only can you have arthritis that can affect the nerve, but you can have other more concerning findings that need to be ruled out, such as a tumor. If nothing is extremely worrisome on the imaging, the mainstay of treatment is conservative. Medications that can help with nerve pain can be tried in attempts to mitigate the symptoms, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, medications that are known to help alleviate nerve pain, such as gabapentin or Lyrica, other medications that are known to help with pain, such as SSRIs, or tricyclic antidepressants and anticonvulsants. Other conservative treatments like physical therapy and massage therapy can also help. We mentioned the diagnostic injections with anesthetic, but you can also add a steroid into that injection in hopes of giving a more therapeutic relief or a longer sustaining relief. Okay, well, what else can help it? Because the nerve penetrates through some of the muscles on the back part of the head, 
Botox can actually help by relaxing the muscles and alleviate the tension on the nerve. And some recent trials demonstrate up to 50% relief with Botox. RFA or radiofrequency ablation has been known to be attempted in some cases of occipital neuralgia, but know that thermally ablating the nerve can have some side effects, such as hyposthesias and dysesthesias. If you guys have followed me, you know that I'm a big fan of neuromodulation, and it does have a role in this disease as well. Basically, you can put a stimulator paddle over the origin of the nerve, and it can deliver a stimulus to override your body's perception of pain in that distribution. If all of those symptoms fail, there is a surgical option that's considered as last resort. Because the C2 nerve is purely a sensory nerve, you can actually cut it and you will not have pain, but in turn, you will lose the sensation of your scalp. And for patients that are having a lot of pain back there, they will gladly trade numbness for pain. What we essentially do in these cases is open up the back part of the neck and dissect down to the dorsal root ganglion of C2 and we just ligate it. Alternatively, if we get down there and there is something compressing the nerve, such as a bone spur, we can just purely do a decompression or a clean out around the nerve and that can also provide benefit. In patients with severe neck pain and clearly erosive osteoarthritis, a fusion of the C1 and C2 joint can also be considered. That's when we go in and place screws at C1 and C2 to immobilize that joint so it no longer moves and while we're in there, we will often ligate that nerve as well. By cutting the nerve, you will get rid of the nerve pain, and by stabilizing that joint, you will get rid of the neck pain that is caused from that osteoarthritis. Remember, I did say that the C1-2 joint provides the lateral motion of the spine, so if you fuse that joint, the patient will have tremendous limitations of their range of motion of their neck when they turn their head side to side, and they will often have to use their body to assist in turning their head. So it is an extremely morbid procedure and should be considered as a last option. I showed this CT of our patient C1, C2 joint on the left side versus the right side and you can see how much arthritis is affecting their right side. I had such significant pain and she was only 65 years old. I felt that a fusion of that joint was necessary to provide her with long-standing definitive relief for the rest of her life. We discussed the pros and cons of every option, including purely decompression, but the likelihood that she will have persistent neck pain. She wanted definitive relief and long lasting relief. She tolerated the procedure very well and went home on post-operative day number two. I did have her wear a neck collar for a total of 12 weeks and she has fully recovered and has had complete relief of her pain. Besides the limited range of motion, she is doing extremely well. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.